Hello everybody, welcome to another Bird Tricks Tuesday. We're uh, Dave and Jamie Womack from birdtricks.com. And today we're gonna fill you in a little bit on some of our training that we've been doing and share some of the insights that we've been experiencing and hopefully show you a little bit of footage of that. Yeah, it seems like we got a lot of feedback uh, last week about how much you guys liked seeing live training sessions. So that was kind of our goal this week, is to show you what we're working on with our own birds and to show you some of those live training sessions. Um, one that's really, really exciting that we got to put in immediately was Common and Tusa. We put them into our main show at the end where they fly to, uh, each one flies to one of us. So we just put that in, which was really cool, and we got to practice it in our bird show, which is earlier in the week. So we got to kind of test it and do it two or three times in the bird Bird show to explain what we were trying to um, achieve for our main show and then we got to put it in the main show which was a little bit of a challenge it took us a couple weeks because the birds needed to get used to snow which we have coming down in our finale and we also have the lights and the music so it was a little bit of a challenge for them but they overcame it in just a couple training sessions so we were excited yeah and one thing that we do is we train the birds live but we talk about this a lot but we train them actually in the bird show it's a we say bird show all the time it's kind of a lecture slash show uh, and so we train them live in front of people so that the birds are used to that training environment. We always say that if you train a bird on a stage with all the elements and then you add an audience, the bird looks at it as a different trick. And so we, we put it all together with almost all of the elements. The audience was the biggest part that you usually get thrown off with and we did that in the bird show so that when the audience is there in our main show, it's a non-issue. They've already done that training. So getting the birds used to flying around snow and and that kind of thing was was a little bit of a challenge, but they had already done that in Parrot Effects. I don't know if you guys have seen that DVD, but uh... yeah, so it was really exciting. <laughs> Most of you that follow us or have followed us for a really long time know that our son Conyers are about three or four years old now and we've actually never trained them anything. <laughs> so we took the opportunity, opportunity to train them something for the very first time and we're working on a new routine which we don't want to say too much because we don't want to give it away but um, just some of the basics of first starting out and teaching them to train and um, teaching them a new trick is, has been really, really cool. So we started with desensitizing them to a box or a crate, like a wooden crate, and making it so that they weren't scared of it by using treats in the clicker. And then our second step was target training them because they've never been target trained before and Lily was the one that picked it up the fastest. The other two weren't so sure. But this is one of the things that we talked about last week where we actually trained all three Sun Conyers at once in order to create really healthy competition and also use a little bit of observational learning. Because Lily picked it up the fastest, the other two were trying to figure out how she was getting a reward all the time. They were also stealing the reward from her feet. Yeah, she'd be holding it, eating it, and the others would go over and take Just it. Just take it from her, which she actually didn't mind because she knew how easily it was, how easy it was to get another treat. So that was a really, really interesting concept to see take place. But um, the other thing was that they not only were they learning from watching her, but they were all learning an environment that created competition. So you'll really see Lily lear uh, leaning over and pushing the others around to get to the target stick. So that was really, really cool. Um, and the third thing we did was we started flying them from a certain distance away and flying them to the box and then getting them comfortable going in. And then the fourth element was getting the lid like shut on them basically. We shut the lid and so we had to get them used to being okay with that darkness and that little change of environment. And only and Dietka, increasing that time And as well. increasing the time. And only Dietka really had an issue with that. She was cheating and she was mostly on the ground eating the pieces that others dropped. But she did all right still. <laughs> she did all right. Now everybody did all right, but she was probably the worst out of the three of you because she yeah. figured out the shortcut to getting treats. So, so yeah. But it was a really, really fun, productive week. Yeah. And part of what we did with the Conyers in our bird show is we were desensitizing them to applause. Applause was really negative and fright frightful for them. Um, and so what we ended up doing is a little bit of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, the stripped down version. Essentially, they were afraid of applause. So we paired applause with the exact time the birds are eating food to start to change that applause equals food and so pretty soon 
through enough training like this, they will understand that the, the applause isn't fearful, it's, it's a sign that food's coming, and so it actually kind of rewires their brain, if you will, and it teaches them that applause is positive instead of scary. Yeah. So that's been, that's an ongoing thing with them, but and they're most of, fearful of it. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I, we had an aha moment, or I guess I did, but with our bird show throughout the week, I noticed that Cressy wasn't actually progressing. She flies through a hula hoop, which we've had a kid hold on stage. When we did this in Parrot Effects, we had somebody in the audience hold a hoop and then she flew through and she did a straight line. She, yeah, flew a straight, straight line through the yeah. audience to the stage. Um, and she always had a little bit of a desensitization issue based on who we picked to um, yeah. to hold the hoop. So it was, she was always learning something and always getting over something in a really positive way and I felt like she was constantly growing. Well here, we've been using a child so that we can give them a gift and it was, it was going really well and she was doing it, but we were using it to demonstrate how birds don't always do what you ask because at a certain point in, in this training, Cressy would always mess up and she would shortcut to Dave. But what I kind of came to the realization of, my aha moment was, Dave, we're not actually training anymore. This has become the trick. Um, her succeeding and then messing up and then succeeding one more time and then end, that became the actual like routine. The routine. And that was the trick that she was getting rewarded for. So she wasn't actually progressing. And I, I finally sat down and talked to you and I was just like, we need to actually go back and, and train this. We need to get rid of the kid, basically, and just you and me work on this. And so we started doing it. And within two training sessions, she progressed from just barely around, like because of the bird show, she just does a little curve to a really giant curve where I'm at the very end of the stage. And she does a really nice yeah. curve. So we're really excited to progress in that and our ideal behavior that we want, if you will, is we want somebody to be able to hold it up in the audience and have her fly out through the audience and come back. So we've got a long way to go, but I'm really excited how fast she progressed. Yeah, or we might even find too that, you know, that's what we ideally want is for somebody else to hold the hoop, but we might also find that what happens is we have to have a pull up with the hoop on it because like Jamie was saying, you know, in some of the some of the different things with our bird show at the theme park or with here, she has to desensitize to who's holding it. So we may find that as we get closer to that end goal that we have to eliminate the person holding it all together, but still it'll be the trick of her flying out through the hoops. Yeah. So we'll see. It might it might go one way or the other. Yeah, we'll it really adapt. depends. We're really we're really all for developing routines and tricks and behaviors around what the birds do naturally. So depending on where Cressy takes this routine is yeah. is really where it'll go. Yeah, we have an idea of what we kind of want, but everything always ends up morphing into something else, which is honestly better and more unique to the bird. So we, think, we like it better. But. I think that's a good point too for training. You know, if you, if you want to achieve something, keep that in mind, but keep in mind that the training's really fluid. It's never absolute. It's never, like, we can't give you, here's A, B, C, D, E, and you end up with the trick. Because what happens is A.2 might have a, a variable that, that we don't anticipate or you don't anticipate. So you have to always be willing to adapt and change based on what direction your bird takes you and try to bring that bird back to where you need it to go. But if you're finding struggles with, with trying to follow an exact a regiment of, of trying to get your bird to do something just always remember that it is fluid and you have to always be thinking through different things that are going to make the bird improve or yeah don't be or, afraid to go off backwards. the beaten path like because i think that really leads to more unique and awesome tricks with the birds because i would just go off of what they what they do naturally and just really work with that or how they morph a behavior because it's ideal we have a friend jason his macaw does a really provocative wave <laughs> with his foot. I don't know if you want to even call it provocative. It's hilarious. And I was just telling him, I'm like, okay, it's really funny. You wouldn't cue it in front of all of your friends, no. but for certain friends, it would be really funny. And so that's one of those tricks that you can put on cue because she just does it naturally. Like that's her wave. And, and, uh, and so it's really funny. So I really like when birds do unique behaviors that you can capture that it's like, well, how did you train that? It's like, well, it's just kind of unique to this bird. Like, we always yes, joke that it was observational learning. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> We're not going to go into detail. <laughs> we won't go into detail. But it is quite funny. So. It doesn't look like a wave. So yeah, and the thing to bring up with the Conyers is that each one of them reacted differently. So that's yeah. the hard thing about trying to teach you guys and tell you guys what to do without being able to see your live training sessions ourselves and, and see how your bird's responding or reacting to you is Lily immediately touched the stick, no problem, and got it. Like yeah. she just understood and she completely got it. Um, 
Phoebe was cheating down below. Or no, Phoebe yeah. was getting it. Uh, yeah. Dietka was cheating. Dietka realized that all the pieces that everybody else was dropping, she could just go get them and she didn't have to figure this stick thing out. So she immediately went down there and just started eating. Um, Phoebe was like in between, as always, middle yeah. child. Um, and she would sometimes touch the stick, but she'd sometimes walk mm-hmm. away from it. Um, and it was, it would, she would sometimes steal the treat from Lily. It would just kind of really varied on her. And I had to show her the treat a lot more than I, I didn't have to show Lily the treat at all. Um, but with Phoebe, I did, I had to like show her that I have millet, you're going to get it, but you have to touch the stick first. And there was a few times where when I showed her the millet, she would immediately touch the stick knowing that it would come closer once she touched the stick. But if it was out of sight, it was like she forgot that the two were even linked. So it's quite interesting. It goes a lot a lot slower for Phoebe and even yeah. slower for Dietka because of getting her focus and her attention. Um, and we were hoping to use the fact that Lily kept earning the rewards as creating jealousy among the other two so that they would try to want to try to figure it out and stuff. So And I think it worked to an extent too, but it, it okay. shows really how even three birds of the same species will will train a little bit differently and you know they've all been essentially raised the same but you have three different results and you said something else that made me think about this too that that was one of the reasons that one day miracles was so um successful and and really i think helped a lot of people is because you saw you saw the end was the end goal and then you saw how the training had to be fluid and you could see through 12 episodes how each bird each bird learned differently, even though there were some species that were the same throughout the course. Yeah. Each one learned a little bit differently. You have to attack each problem or progression of a new good behavior. You had to all approach it differently. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of One Day Miracles, we were really excited because we actually got an email from Karen and John Blonde. And I don't know how many of you have seen One Day Miracles. I don't remember which episode they ended up being. Their episode makes you want to cry. Yeah, it's, they're it's absolutely a, amazing. It's a huge success story. Uh, especially when they sent us the after footage, it was... Yeah, and they have an Amazon and a Blue and Gold Macaw, and they were basically asking us um, for advice on how to socialize their birds with their grandchildren. Their grandchildren are only one year and two years old. And I just wanted to say that, and I'll leave a link in the description of this video, but I blogged about everything I did with our daughter Capri, like completely, even the times that she accidentally got bitten or had a negative experience, which we really tried to avoid in the beginning so that she wasn't fearful of the birds. But I do feel like it's okay, and I like I know I'm gonna get people hating me for this, I feel like it's okay for the child to get a little bit hurt um, such as like pinched or bitten where it's not it's not obviously taking off a finger or something because I feel like Kids need to to have respect for the fact that the animal will hurt them if the child doesn't do what the animal wants or or, or doesn't want um, so for me I feel like it's really important to explain to our children the consequence of their behavior versus just saying don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Kids hate being told what not to do. So what we can do is explain the consequence and then they either choose that consequence or they don't. So for Capri, she absolutely loves holding our birds. She would pet them day and night, 24 hours a day. She loves holding them. But what I've told her and tried to explain to her as she's gotten a little bit older is that she doesn't always want to be cuddled. So when she wants to hold a bird and it doesn't want to be held, she's gotten to the point where she can actually read the body language and stuff. And she kind of gets hurt feelings. And it's like, well, Capri, do you want to cuddle right now? And she only usually wants to cuddle when she's tired. So she'll usually say no. And I'm like, well, I want to cuddle with you. Will you cuddle with me? No. But I want to cuddle with you. It's hurting my feelings that you don't want to cuddle with me. No, I don't want to cuddle. Well, the bird doesn't want to be held. So just like you don't want to cuddle, the bird doesn't want to be held right now. So you just need to respect it. If you make it and you make it like make so make it sure well, make it so that you have to hold the bird right now and you force the bird into it, she's gonna get upset and she might bite you. So as long as Capri knows what the consequence is going to be, she can choose it. So does she want to be bitten? No. So she's likely not gonna choose that consequence. Um, so I just feel like that's really important. But also I blogged about all of everything that I did and I feel like for a one to two year old range age range all I really did with Capri at that point was I let her give the birds treats so that she was a positive thing in their environment and even to this day she's never held Comet or Tusa or Camelot Macaws we just don't feel like either one is ready I don't think that she's even given them treats she hasn't given them treats um we just from body language and interaction I just don't feel comfortable with it yet I don't feel confident about it I would have felt great with her with Rocco actually she probably could have yeah. held him before we left but I just didn't do it because 
I was by myself and it's just harder to like work by yourself and have Rocco and have her and I just I chickened out I just, yeah I chickened out. but she really wants to hold him but I, just as a example she hasn't held comment too so yeah she hasn't yeah. given them treats it just really depends I just it's so hard to tell people that yeah. because I feel like you have to be able to read your bird and read your child and be able to explain certain things I think it really depends on on the bird um, as she said you know that, that Capri hasn't held two of our birds and we like to believe that we know what we're doing. Maybe you have a bird that's similar to Comet or Tusa. Maybe you really shouldn't let your child touch or hold the bird or even feed the bird possibly. Um, where we'll start with Capri when she's ready is we will allow her to hand treats to the bird in an environment that is going to set her up and the birds up for success. So for some people, it may be when the bird's in the cage and the bird's trying to reach through the cage bars as far as it can to just barely be able to grab that treat. That might be the case for us, or we might right. find that that's an aggressive area and the bird's defending the cage and doesn't want the child near the cage. So you have to try to weigh all that into the equation of, of when you try to work these things in. Mm -hmm. Going back to, um, to Karen and, and John and their bird, I want to say blue is more likely to be able to, um, the blue and gold macaw is more likely to take a treat from the yeah. child than, than, than Merlin than was. Merlin. Yeah, I, I agree because blue loved to work for, for the treats and mm -hmm. she liked to perform and do tricks. So where I would start with blue is having the kids cue the behaviors or you cue the behaviors and click and you just tell the child every time I click go ahead and offer her a treat. Usually when you're offering a treat you can tell if the bird has the intention to take the treat or take your finger. And another thing with having cue the trick, click, and then have the child give the treat, the bird is now focused on, I did the trick, I'm looking for the reward. It's not thinking about how can I bite the kid in some cases, or hopefully most cases, yeah. versus just having the child give a treat. The, the bird may not understand what the child's trying to do, but if it's paired with the end of a trick that it knows well, and it understands that you cue this, I get a click, I get a treat, it's gonna increase your likelihood of that being a successful interaction as well. Yeah, I love that. I really love that. So hopefully, if you guys can read some of the blogs, that can give you some helpful takeaways and things that might fit your situation that also fit ours, but also recognize that you may not be able to do it. It may not just be right yet for the age of your child or the age of your bird or where your bird's at. You might need some more training. Um, Capri likes to be a part of everything, so some of the things that we did early on was she would help me prepare the bird's food. She would help me gather up the dishes. Just being around and in their presence got them used to seeing her and got her used to seeing them. So even that sort of desensitization is really, really good for both sides. And, and we've addressed it with a child our age, but if you have a child that's older than two, like let's say six or seven, and is very good at following directions, you could tell the child to be calm, all that kind of thing. You could, when you have touch trained your bird, let's say through the cage, and the bird's going over and it's touching the chopstick on one side of the cage, and then it runs the other side to touch the chopstick over there, all the time you're clicking and reinforcing with a treat. You could set your child up for success by doing it this way and having your child do the, the first target, when have the bird touch the chopstick, click, and then you give the treat see how the bird's body action, body language and reaction is in that scenario before allowing your child to also do the full routine. But I think it's important to obviously explain that, the, that your child shouldn't do this without you there. And so I wouldn't go into any like full cueing the tricks and doing everything on their own um, unless you're there supervising it and they're the age where they can understand and respect that. Because otherwise they can go and screw up all the training that you've done if they, when you're away, go and cue everything um, and reinforce at the wrong times or yeah. make something negative on accident like unintentionally. And we worked with a lot of kids when we um, toured with Ringling Brothers in our pre-show. We walked around with our birds and put them on kids and anybody who wanted it for pictures. And what we noticed is the kids that are nervous about it and, and don't want it and you want it for them are not the kids to do this with because most likely they're they're scared anyway so the, at the slightest sign of nervous body language from the bird they're going to drop their hand or they're going to do something sudden out of fear that is going to make the entire uh, situation negative and we had that happen so much it was like parents pressuring their kids to hold a bird that the kid didn't wasn't comfortable holding and in the end the kid and the bird always lost out fortunately so. our birds are flight trained so they would just take flight and come back to us um, and hopefully yours are as well. If they're not, that's a reason to possibly flight train them or avoid that situation. So one of the things I wanted Dave to actually mention on this video is um, everybody always asks, asks us, wow, I cannot talk today. <clears throat> 
Everyone always asks us what treats we use for our birds and I know it's asked in a way where you think that you can use what we use for our birds for your birds and have it work but it's not always necessarily like that mm -hmm. and Dave explained this really well on our One Day Miracles series with that blue and gold macaw so I wanted him to kind of explain it to you guys here so you could get help with that. On another note we we use pine nuts and spray millet mostly. <laughs> So you might want to start there. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like, I don't want to feel like it didn't answer it. But. Yeah, so what we have found is is you want to start when the bird would naturally be motivated or a little bit hungry. Um, and then you want to take take a teaspoon or a measuring cup of any kind. Just put a, a little bit of every single treat that you can think of. So for smaller birds, it might be safflower seeds, some spray millet, some pine nuts, some small shell sunflower seeds, not salted. Maybe it's... Um, you could even use peas if your bird really likes like corn or peas. That would totally work if, if your bird's willing to work for that. Yeah, or walnut chunks or almond chunks. Um, some other things, we've had dry mango. That's been a big one for some birds, is dry mango chunks. We try not to use much fruit because of sugar and other issues that that causes. But um, anyway, take all of those different things that you think your bird might want, put them in little piles equally surrounding the bird, like picture, picture a clock, the bird's in the very center, and at 12 o'clock you've got one food, and at one and two and three, and so you've got all dials of the clock, there's food around the bird, and, and let it see what it eats first, and second and third, and then you'll know, you know, okay, it, it's whatever it's consuming the most of, it's probably its favorite treat. So use that as either a primary or secondary treat, and then see what the number two treat is that it likes, and you might find, like in our case, we rotate between almonds and um, pine nuts because those are our bird's top two treats. Usually we'll do an almond if it's like a, a really big jackpot reward. It takes them a little bit longer to eat, um, so you don't want to give that as a, the main thing, but this is kind of how we kind of how we out figure out which ones each bird likes. Because even all, between our flock, it's all different. But we can get away across the board with everybody with pine nuts, except for the Conyers, they, they need something like spray millet. Yeah, and also like if you if your bird does like almonds or it likes some sort of larger nut than a pine nut, which we actually have for our birds, like half, like cut in half, um, you can use you can actually cut one single almond into eight pieces. I did it for Rasta for an Alexandrian uh, parakeet because I was working with him and he would only work for almonds. So I learned how to cut it into pieces of eight. So you can literally get eight repetitions out of one almond. <laughs> I don't know if you guys that. All right, well, that's it from us. Uh, just keep the feedback going on the blog and uh, the comment sections, all the questions you have. All of this is really good. It helps us be able to really focus what you need from us and how we can best help you. So, yeah. And don't be discouraged if we don't answer your uh, question in a video. We do try to get to all of them, but obviously we're long-winded, so we can usually only answer one, one or two questions at a, a week. But I do try to respond to you guys on the blog and on YouTube and answer your questions and refer you to helpful links and stuff. So hopefully you guys keep asking your questions. Also, if anybody's interested, we've had quite a few people come out. Uh, we are on the Norwegian Dawn, Norwegian Cruise Line's Dawn, um, Boston to Bermuda. We're on this ship for uh, till November 22nd. So if you want to come hang out in person, just book a cruise and, uh, and come pick our brains. It'd be fun to, to talk to you about your birds and, and see some of our training, do some meet and greets. But uh, that option's always open, so um, book a cruise. We'll see you soon. <laughs>